Nate, thanks for joining us today. I think it's going to be really interesting to get that that perspective. A lot of people don't realize that law enforcement, they come face to face with this stuff sometimes. I mean, you know, you guys get called into so many different homes and buildings and properties and sure. and especially those working that third shift at night. Yeah. Because uh, there really does seem to be uh, something about the darkness, uh, you know, at night where the activity does seem to to be higher uh, from my experience. And I'm, you know, I'm sure most experiences you've had probably are in, in the night hours, I would assume anyway. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and there's always that, um, that, that superstition about the full moon and things like that as well, you know, and that's not superstition. Ask anybody that works in the ERs, a doctor, a nurse, paramedic, firefighter, cop, that <laughs> there's something to be said about the full moon for sure. Yeah. Well, we do hear that a lot, actually. People that work, uh, hospitals and mental hospitals they all have some kind of different term for you know when there is a full moon i wonder what that is you know happens with animals too with animals does it mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i think i've heard that yeah that you know dogs will start howling and just strange behavior in general so that being said you know obviously you've worked with us on a couple of different mm-hmm. cases helping us get your perspective on things and what's also interesting about what you're talking about right now about how animals have that type of sense uh you know it's been documented we know it to be true we don't necessarily know how it works that they know a, a tsunami's coming or some type of a disaster or even the effects of a full moon but you know animals definitely have a, a completely different sense when it comes to the paranormal uh, we've seen that time and time again where animals are, are receptive to it or see things that we don't see. How many different times do you hear about an animal seeing something or following it with its eyes in the room? Uh, the person doesn't see it, but then a few seconds later, the door shuts uh, or there's something that falls off, mm-hmm. a, off a table. So it's like they knew it was there. They were aware of its presence. And then, Jamie, your dog, I mean, Archer, we've used Archer in an investigation. Um, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you know, you've, you've got more experience in that realm. Why do you think these animals have that sense or, or what things have you observed personally in that respect? I mean, I worked with dogs for 15 years before joining Haunted Saginaw and dogs and cats and animals in general, they, they can sense all the energy around them. So like when I was working as a dog groomer, if one person in that grooming salon was having a bad day, every single dog on those tables would have a bad day, would give the groomer a horrible time just because that one single groomer's energy was negative. Then the dogs fed off of that and they were able to just feel that energy. So I feel like when it comes to the paranormal, it it's very similar. They sense what others may not sense and they know that it's there because they just they feel it. They just, they just know it's there. So even though we can't see the ghosts or the spirit, whatever, whatever's there, they feel their energy kind of like how a REM pod will pick up the energy around it. They can feel that energy around them. So more more like a, more like a sensory thing. Obviously it's not a piece of equipment, but it's just their senses. Yeah. They have like that sixth sense towards that type of thing. Well, and I I can actually speak to that as well. And you make a really good point. And so Let's, let's make it in the most simplistic form. People who have dogs, uh, there's, well, I mean, almost every single dog owner can, can give you an instance where their dog, you know, either started barking or growling um, before something happened, before someone came to the door, before somebody even got there. Um, there's, there's a really cool scientific study that I watched when I was in canine handler school where they put cameras in a home and the the homeowner wasn't there. The, the dog's owner wasn't there. The dog's free to run around the home. And as soon as there was cameras with the homeowner, they were out getting groceries, let's say. And as soon as that homeowner had gotten in their car to start coming back home, these dogs would start pacing in, in anticipation of them to get there. Now, there's not any physical way that a dog would know that. Let's take it up just another notch. If you talk to any canine handler. I can guarantee you almost any canine handler, police officer or or service member in the US military who's worked with dogs can tell you that the dog a lot of times will alert you before something happens. And it's not their training, it's not this, it's that. It's just something that they have in them. There's so many instances where I, when I was running a dog, the dog would his temperament would just immediately change and he would he would start start growling. Um before somebody something happened um service members working with their dogs and you get that really close bond there's countless experiences of people who work closely with animals that can attest to the fact that the the demeanor changes before something happens there's officers who have been in shootings who said that their dog was just acting 
absolutely peculiar for that particular shift for that dog before a critical incident happened. Same with, with people in the military working dogs overseas. Their dog was acting bizarrely before an IED or something happened, you know, something tragic. There's a lot of a lot of instances that we just kind of accept as, oh, yeah, that's, that's the dog's being a dog when, when really there, there's more to that. And if you've worked with a dog as closely and intimately as, as you develop that bond with your partner, you, you pick up on that like they pick up on you. And there's things that certainly they're picking up on that human beings aren't. So wouldn't that be in its most simplest, simplistic form, the fact that they, they are keyed into something that we're not? So if they're keyed into something that we're not, how can we discredit human beings who are keyed into something that we're not? I guess that's the question. And, I, and I'm not lending credibility to that or taking away from it either. I'm saying that we have to be objective and open-minded to that. You know, I guess, you know, for those that aren't familiar with you at this point, you know, let us know how, how long you've been in law enforcement and, and your role. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm a, a captain with a, an agency here in Michigan. I've been in law enforcement for, oh gosh, 12 years now. Um, my background is a firefighter and as a paramedic. So I've got this, this whole litany of, of resume stacked up that just is emergency services over the last 20 years total. Well, first of all, we have an interesting story, you know, of how we met. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that, do. you know, that's definitely very interesting. So, you know, what? I, in fact, I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you tell the audience exactly how it was <laughs> that, that we came to know each other. Yeah. So I was working night shift and I, I was working canine at the time. I had a dog with me. I worked canine for five years and it was near the end of my shift and I was driving downtown Sag and I headed back to, to where my headquarters was and I was driving past the stable and I remember it was dark and the street was empty and I saw lights, the flashlights or something moving around inside the stable. And I, I remember thinking to myself, oh God, the place is getting broken into. I'm going to get out late. Right. And so I park around the corner and I get my dog out and I've got my gun out and I'm, I'm ready to do the whole thing. <laughs> and I come around the front of the building and I'm about to call it out on the radio. And, and here comes, here comes Steve Shipley with a box. And I said, Hey, and next thing I'm like, Hey dude, what's up? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. This, this is the friendliest robber I've ever met. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? And he said, oh, we're from Haunted Saginaw. We're, we're, uh, we're doing a paranormal investigation inside here with uh, one of the radio stations. And kind of, uh, almost condescendingly, I said, oh, really? Are you getting anything good? And at that point, we're standing at the threshold of the door. And I remember you you pointed up and you said, yeah, that. And you you could clearly hear what sounded, I would, I would describe it as taking a box or like a Rubbermaid container, something with some texture and scooting across the floor in the second, second, second story. And, uh, I said, what is that? He said, that's been going on all night long. And I said, it, well, there's probably somebody up there. Right. And he said, no, there's nobody up there. You're like, and you were gracious about it. You're like, do you want to come in and check it out? And I'm like, no, hard. No, no, I don't want to go check that out ever. And, uh, Sure enough, I mean, you were, you were gracious about it. You had a legit investigation. I went home on time, but it, it certainly started off that that uh, that friendship because we ran into each other then at, at Finn Road of all places. Right? Yeah, years later. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was interesting. You know, we, you know, Finn Road is a whole. I mean, that's a whole different animal there. You know, but being out there on that on that rural property in the farmland, and then when we ran into each other in the in the town, I thought this is crazy. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because I remember uh, meeting you on Hamilton Street. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, that man, Finn Road. It's like even just saying Finn Road just changed my whole, sure, you know, brain and demeanor. That place was so intense. You know, there was so much happening there. Uh, I mean, I guess that being said, going into Finn Road, I mean, what was it like for you? I remember when you, uh, I remember when you first came to the house. You know, you seemed a little apprehensive to some degree about, you know, the stories that were being told about the property. And I remember you saying something uh, that I, I haven't forgotten where you said, you know, I'm too, I'm far too Catholic for that kind of thing, you know? And it, yeah. that's true. Yes. Yeah. So I grew up actually in Essexville where, where that, that house is and it's a small town. So there's always lore and conjecture and stories and rumors that go with haunted or creepy places, or I shouldn't say haunted places, but places that are assumed to be haunted or, you know, that's what the legend, you know, uh, tells the story of. And, um, that was always kind of a landmark, hallmark, creepy looking place that there was a lot of um, a lot of rumor around. So when I moved back to Essexville a handful of years ago, and all of a sudden I ran into you out there, I, I was I was more surprised not to necessarily see you, but that that house was still kind of a hot topic. That, you know, is this still a thing? Type of type of thing with it, and that was surprising to me. 
we didn't know what we were getting into, you know, when we started to investigate that. And I guess, you know, I, I should elaborate for people that are watching this. Maybe they haven't seen the film. For those that are listening, one of our investigations, you can find it on Amazon Prime. Uh, you can stream it there, A Haunting on Finn Road, which is a family um, had lived in that homestead from the beginning. I, they, they built the house uh, in the 1800s and um, it had been in the family the entire time. And uh, at that point, uh, the woman, Rebecca, and her, and her husband inherited the home. Their father passed away. And then at that point, when they did inherit the home, uh, things went quickly uh, haywire. They always knew the home to have some activity. They all had different experiences growing up in the house. But when she moved into the house, started to kind of fix it up and do renovations, uh, things got really out of control to the point where they contacted us and we got involved. And that's when we uh, started the investigation, which we definitely will never forget uh, the things that happened at Finn Road. But that being said, uh, yeah, it was great to have you, you know, involved in that investigation to give us your opinion. And, you know, for those listening and, and or watching, let us know what, you know, what role that you played, what that investigation at Finn Road. So where I came into play, and this is my, my genuine hardline stance is, is I certainly have skeptical beliefs, but I think that for being in law enforcement, I'm a lot more open-minded. Uh, and we, we can get to that in a minute here, right? But uh, my role was really to come in, uh, to be objective, to try to, I guess, debunk the things that were alleged to be occurring out there, the things that you guys obviously caught. Uh, there were things that obviously we could explain that they didn't make the film because they made perfect sense. But there were a lot of things I don't have any way of explaining it. And, and you know, there's always the, the skeptics who watch the movies or the shows and they have a quick answer for, oh, it was a this, or they, you know, the, oh, oh, look, there's, there's a string there. And I can tell you that that wasn't a fun house mere effect. That wasn't, it was legit, whatever you're, whatever it was. And I'm not, I'm not going to slap a label on it. That's not my area of expertise, but whatever you caught, the things that you caught were legitimately happening beyond reasonable ex explanation. You know, that's one thing I found fascinating about that house is it didn't, whatever was there didn't seem to really discriminate about who it would show itself to or, or when it would make its noises, you know, because just like you being there and, and several other officers came and went from the house while we were filming and, 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 and did help us out and interview with us and partake a little bit. And what was interesting is that they would have experiences, even when they weren't there to observe any, you know, maybe they were just there to talk to us about like the fire that happened. Right when we were filming there that to this day, I mean, that was so the odds of that are astronomically bizarre. You know, sure. the fact that this power line, even though there wasn't a windstorm, there wasn't anything logical that the power line came down and hit the ground, started a fire and then literally burned a ring of fire perfectly around the entire house. And in the fire was so intense uh, that, you know, the neighbors were seeing it. People were, had called nine one one. And you can see the pattern of the fire that burnt around the house. It would leave things completely untouched, which makes no sense. I mean, there was uh, parts of the home. Uh, I don't know what you want to call that decorative stuff. Basically up at the peaks mm -hmm. had fallen down and been there for, I mean, who knows, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. The fire went right past that original part of the house. Didn't scorch it, didn't burn it, but yet it burned you know, the ground and everything around it, but that all the way around the entire house. Yeah. And, and to that point, you know, I'm not suggesting that it should have caught the whole house on fire, but you've got, you know, 40 year old dried out lattice around the, the porch, for example. Yeah. And yet there was no, no scorching on in that. the entire porch. Right. Exactly. Yeah, all it was, wood. It was yeah. all burned under the porch. Yeah. Under the yet. porch. And that wood is so old. Yeah. I mean, you would have thought that that porch would have went up in flames like that. So you guys don't know this, but I actually went out there afterwards after um, one of the other officers had done their, their segment on that and was looking at that. And, and I thought we had to have missed something, right? And, and this was for my own sake, not for your sake, not for the integrity of the investigation. So I went out there and, and really dug into it. No cameras, no one was there. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't find where anything was charred. I, I would pick up a piece of wood and there was soot on it from being in there, but I could brush that off. There was no, there was no damage to this for all intent and purposes. Kindling, right? That, right. That's just weird. Yeah, it's super weird. Yeah, yeah, there was that one part where the big pile of wood was less than six inches away from that was the gutter that came down. The gutter was completely melted to the ground, but yet that wood was untouched. Yeah, it was really strange. I don't have, the, again, I don't have an explanation for that. Yeah, literally melted the aluminum gutter. Yeah. That was really intense, that entire investigation. Um, but that's, you know, that's to me what was so interesting about that haunting is that, you know, whatever was there had that power, you know, from our experience, you know, just 
nonstop interference. Something was trying to drive us away from that home, you know, in our opinion, for sure. But again, you know, bringing law enforcement back into it, that's what's so interesting is that you guys were able to come there and be able to look at it very objectively because you know it's no secret i'm sure that they were there wondering uh, was this arson was you know what is happening here police officers as a rule are, are they usually drive trucks they usually vote republican they're usually pretty conservative people um certainly behind closed doors we have our own opinions about things but in in the face of the public we're typically very conservative you, you're not going to see police officers you're not going to see me come out and say that yes it's a this or that's that because we don't know a lot of times if we don't have those answers we get back in our car, we're calling somebody and saying, hey, what do you think about this? We, we inherently want to, to solve the crime, solve the mystery, solve the puzzle, uh, get to the bottom of the evidence, make the facts, make the pieces of the puzzle fit. So if I don't have an answer for something, I'm going to call somebody that does. I'm not going to let it just rest with, you know, me and my opinion, because I'm only an expert so far into certain things where it's out of my realm of expertise and I have to call somebody else. So there's been plenty of calls made where it's, hey, what do you think about this? Or why would, the, just use the fire, for example, why would this be melted, but this wouldn't? Okay, that makes sense. It could be an arc flash from the electricity that melted that. It's hot enough. It makes sense. But what about everything else? Well, I don't have an explanation for that. Hmm. Okay. You know, so it doesn't just stop with me or other law enforcement. Uh, if you use Merrill, for example, uh, one of your other investigations, you had the FBI, you had the state police, you had the sheriff's department, you had all these entities out there, great minds. I mean, no nonsense, old school cops with the Marlboros and the cowboy boots who don't take prisoners and they can't figure it out. And you've got a collaboration of people trying to sort this thing out. To, to that end though, prove to me that ghosts exist, but prove to me that they don't. I, I guess that's where I stand because if you, if you look at it from an objective standpoint, which I do, there's almost 8 billion people in the world, right? 80% of those people, me being one of them, believe that you go somewhere when you die. They believe in an afterlife. Whatever their spirituality, religion, customs, belief system is, whatever it is, 80% of the world's population believe in some type of an afterlife. And again, me included with that. And paranormal folks are people who are involved in it. They fit into three categories. The, you guys are nuts. You're hallucinating. Stop doing drugs. Yeah, I guess it could be possible. And yes, it is possible. So you got your three primary groups with that. So let's just say over the last thousand years of recorded history, and we know that since the last thousand years, we've got tons of instances of people, millions of instances of people reporting spiritual activities become part of their belief system and cultures and, and worshiping the dead and things like that. You've got this huge litany of people who believe in, in let's say ghosts. Okay, let's use that term. If 99.9999999 repeating percent of those there is a logical explanation. Let's just, let's just pretend that you can't explain those things away. If even out of a million instances, one, just one instance is legit or, or so extreme, which we know they, they exist, that you can't explain away. Doesn't that one instance alone lend enough credibility that should at least pique your interest to be objective, to look at it from a different lens? Oh, absolutely. So to that point, if, if people are already believing that you go somewhere when you where you die. For me, heaven or hell, right? If you're already there, how can you in good conscience say, I absolutely believe you go somewhere when you die, but I only believe this, I don't believe this. There can't be this, but there is this. That's the part that gets me. And again, I'm not an expert enough to say where you do and where you don't go, but I think that we have to be objective enough to say that, are we looking at this from all the angles we should be? Or are we being closed-minded about it? That doesn't particularly fare well in the law enforcement community with staunch, hardcore Republican truck driving, you know, cops who who have that that machismo about them. So yeah. it hasn't been necessarily easy for me. Uh, I'm not going to lie and say that I haven't received criticism because I have, but I'm I'm firm in my convictions and I'm I'm firm in the fact that we have to be objective. That you can't explain everything away. You you can't. You have to look at this from a different perspective, even if that perspective is we don't know. Yeah, well, that's the thing is, I think that so many people, you know, they're afraid to to not have that control, basically, and not just law enforcement, but, I, you know, skeptics in general, I think that they don't want to consider the possibility that they don't have all the answers. 
you know, that, hey, this is what I believe, so this is what it is. There's there's no exception. You know, there's heaven and hell, nothing else. No spirits could ever be earthbound. Um, or some people that don't believe in anything, you know, just completely atheist and believe that, you know, this is what there is. And once we die, that, that it's over off. with. Yeah, you flip the switch and that's it. Yeah. God, there's been so many cases out there that have been proven to either be debunked or find out that they were fictitious or whatever the case may sure, be. Of course. But how many have been backed up and that's the thing there's been so many experiences you know it's it's almost amazing when you talk to you know people that you know friends family whatever the case may be and you find out that so many people you know have had a, an experience you know so many different experiences and how do you explain that you know and even just you know and what do you want to classify as paranormal i mean is it is it simply an apparition a ghost uh, an object moving on its own or what about other things uh, such as you know, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this, maybe you have or haven't, but I, I would assume you have where you talk to somebody that, that had a dream about somebody that, that passed away that day mm -hmm. or that somebody recently passed away and then that person experienced some type of visitation from them. What, what do you call that intuition? You know, is that, does that not somehow border the realm of paranormal? So there, there's two things to this, right? First of all, we kn we have actual scientific proven fact that there'll be identical twins and in the exact moment one of those twins passes away on the other side of the country or the world, the other twin somehow immediately knows that. Yeah, knows something is wrong. That's been documented a lot. You're right. That, that's yeah. proven. Yeah. It's not disputable. That's proven fact. We know scientifically that going back to the full moon thing, that animals act differently. We know that before earthquakes, it's documented over hundreds of years that animals start acting bizarrely. They'll start pawing at the ground or they'll start running around. It, very odd behavior, consistently odd behavior before a natural disaster. We know that before the tsunami, tsunami struck in, in, in uh, Asia a couple of years ago or a handful of years ago, there were pods of mammals, uh, sea life, dolphins, things like that that swam far out to sea before it came. There's reports that elephants were breaking free from their, their moorings and, and seeking higher ground. These are all things that are recorded as actual history before these things have struck. So how can you in good conscience as a skeptic simply say that these things can't be possible when it's been documented and literally proven by the world's best scientists that it does happen with different species, but yet we're, we're impervious to that. We, we, we don't fall into that category. That's why I've chosen to hitch my wagon to haunted Saginaw. It's not that I necessarily do or don't believe. I, I still am a skeptic in many regards. However, I have personally witnessed you as a producer here, make the decision not to use evidence that in my book would have been great evidence that I can't explain, but because you can't validate the sterility of it because there might have been a car or somebody walking by that could have somehow contaminated it you've chosen not to use that so i can vouch for the fact that i've seen you personally on one-on-one -on -one time when you're doing editing say i can't in good conscience use this even though it's like the, the gold or platinum piece of evidence just because there could there could have been something external that could have had some influence on it and i really respect that i don't have the answers i'm not going to pioneer the field I'm just a dumb street cop, right? But at the same time, I think that we have to be conscientious and be objective when it comes to things like this because there's things we can't explain. And why I think the tipping point for me is when all these cops, these old school cops who are now retired, can talk about the experiences out, out in Merrill and the things they experienced back in the 70s. And I've personally seen these police reports, handwritten police reports, the good old days, by these cops that I hold in very high regard and and you know, they're, they're legends based on the, the heroic things they've done over their years. And they're putting their, their sworn testimony on paper saying this happened. I was here. I saw this and your films only, you know, can only be so long, but that film could have gone on for days. Without a doubt, that case was definitely one of the most fascinating, you know, not taking away anything from like Amityville or, or one of these cases. But I mean, what happened at that old Pomeranian farmhouse and the amount of documentation, the amount of police reports, the different law enforcement agencies. I mean, have you ever seen anything like that? Yeah. During a homicide. I mean, maybe, you know, but for something like that, no, no. And I guess, I guess to go back to my point before that's, I guess, seeing all these old school cops who are willing to come out and say, no, I'm, I don't know what, what the hell it was, but something was going on. And I personally witnessed this, that I guess sparked the willingness for me to voice my, um, let's call it open-mindedness. You don't see that depth of an investigation 
uh, unless there's really something to it. We, as police officers, we get called all the time to cuckoo birds who are, are you know, reporting the neighbors crawling through the walls and, and things like that. And we, we go and we, we give it the attention that it deserves and, you know, it's on to the next call. But when you're systematically, continually dealing with the same problem, if nothing else, you are making a conscious effort to, aha, gotcha, you're making this up. And I think for a lot of those officers, a lot of those deputies, that was exactly the case. We'll, we'll get them. They're wasting our time, but they never could. Now, that unto itself is odd. Right. I, all you got to do is sit there and you'll be able to see that someone's, you know, lighting off cherry bombs to make the loud explosions and, or, or somebody's running around the house and knocking on the walls. So when you've got people on the inside and the outside and you've got your perimeter covered and you're actually doing this and you're working on it and you've got all your angles covered because you've had nothing but time to plan your attack to catch them in the act of deceit, but yet you can't. And you can say, no, I was outside. No one was outside here. I was watching the entire time. I was 25 feet away in the bushes watching with binoculars. I mean, that, that's got to that's gotta say something. You know, that's, that's a big, that, in law enforcement, that's a big deal. To me, that's one of the craziest things about what happened at Dice Road is just the, you know, the, the level of law enforcement that was involved in that case and even stakeouts, multiple stakeouts, yep. and they still couldn't catch anybody, but yet they were still witnessing the phenomenon, the pounding on the house and uh, fires taking place. Uh, I guess, you know, we're, we're going to continue to cover Dice Road no matter what. I mean, we have Charles Frisbee coming in here. Uh, the the Pomerang brothers are going to come in here. So we're going to keep touching on that. But, you know, once again, for those that haven't seen it, you can watch A Haunting on Dice Road. Uh, you can stream that on Amazon Prime, of course, and uh, definitely one of the most in, incredible cases uh, in paranormal history for that matter. You know, and that's what's so interesting to me is that you know, I mean, yeah, we see, obviously, today it's widely accepted in pop culture. I'm, and I'm sure, you know, there's a good a good portion of the population that still is very uh, scared of it. It's still a taboo subject. But, you know, again, it's all over your television. Mm -hmm. It's all over networks. It's all over, you know, people have no fear of talking about the paranormal at this point. Sure. You know, you're not going to be burned at the stake. But, however, it's been with us this long. So it, it boggles my mind that there are still people out there that are not willing to accept that this stuff happens. Uh, no matter what you want to say, you know, some people right. want to say, okay, well, if anything is truly taking place, any type of spirit activity, then therefore it's demonic. Right. You know, there are certain religions that that's, that's the belief, mm -hmm. whether it's demonic, whether it's poltergeist activity, whether it's residual activity an intelligent spirit haunting, whatever it is, you have to be able to admit that it does happen, but people are still, you know, some people are still afraid to do that. And that that's what boggles my mind is it's not just something that you see in certain dynamics. I mean, you see wealthy people uh, that, that are having problems in their home, you know, wealthy, poor, educated, not educated, uh, single, divorced. It doesn't matter. It's a huge spectrum. So it's across a broad, very broad spectrum globally. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what blows my mind is that, you know, it, this, this has always been there, but you know, I guess no one's really going to have the answers, you know, until I guess you're on the other side, so to speak, you know, that's yeah. just kind of the way it is. But yeah. I, all we can do at this point, I guess, is continue to investigate it and, and look for any type of patterns to figure out, you know, what's truly happening. Well, you know, so, so to that point as well, Steve, if it's been around since recorded history, we know that we, we know that it has, you make a really valid point that for me as an investigator, one of the components that I, I have to look at that doesn't allow me to, to be closed minded about it is you, you have a huge spectrum of people across the entire world for a thousand years or, or more of all demographics. Now, it can't possibly be all mass hallucinations. It's not drug use. It's not pareidolia. It's not, it's not whatever people want to explain it away. It, it can't, maybe some isolated instances or, or various things, but it's not all just wiped away with, with a, a big paintbrush. It, it, can't, it can't be, it, it's not, it's not, it's not logical. No. And, and like you said, different, uh, different regions of the country, different religions. There's a lot of similarities, you know, to people that couldn't have communicated Right back then, you know, and you look at different biblical texts or different religious texts from different parts of the country, the world, mm -hmm. there's a lot of similarities. Um, that's the thing. It just really makes you wonder, you know, what are these forces that are out there? Um, 
you know, what are they seeking to achieve sometimes? You know, that's what's so fascinating about the subject, but I guess that's why the research just, you know, continues. I know that there's some things that you can't go into, uh, obviously with, you know, with your line of work, but have you ever known any officers to have experiences, you know, that they, that they've kind of told you about after the fact or going into some of these houses or situations, or even just maybe working the beat in the middle of the night? Yeah. Well, funny you should mention that actually. Yeah. So I'm going to try to be as vague so that the, I don't, I don't call them out because anybody who knows me is going to be pretty quick to pick up who it is. There's a particular officer that i um, very close with and you have a, a stand here, talk to him, conversation over a cup of coffee. He's going to, he's going to divorce himself from paranormal. And that's, you know, a bunch of nonsense. However, there, there is a particular home in the area uh, that they had grown up, grown up in. And they, to this day, don't even like to drive by the house because as they were growing up in there, there was such terrifying experiences that shook this person to their core so much that there was a call in the general area and they they, they didn't want anything to do with it. It, it was, um, I happened to be there with them. Um, I'm trying to be as cagey as I can about it, but yeah. to answer your question, yeah. So, you know, they'll stand there at a cup of coffee with their, their nice pressed uniform and that's ah, a bunch of nonsense, you know, there's no ghosts. But you ask them on a confident level, uh, their experience, and, and they'll, they'll give you a hundred really terrifying examples that, you know, make your skin crawl. I don't, like I said before, I'm too Catholic for that. I don't keep me away from that nonsense, but I know this person because I would take a bullet for them and they would take a bullet for me. And when they say this happened, it happened. And, and there's no, there's no questioning. And I, I, I believe it with every fiber of my being, I believe them. I believe that what they said happened actually happened. Not that they believe that it happened, but that if that's what they say happened this person that I would take a bullet for and lie my life, lay my life down for, and they for I, I believe them, you know? So yeah, I mean, it's, it's out there. And, and when people like that, who are very important people in my life say, no, this, this listen, bro, I'm telling you, this happened. It, it's, you would believe them. It's pretty amazing that it, it affects him to this day, you know, but I'm not surprised though. I mean, people that haven't had uh, a one-on-one -on -one experience with some type of entity or the paranormal definitely won't uh, understand how that can have long lasting effects, you know, I mean, even to this day and, and he's roughly how old now in his thirties in his thirties. And, and how old was he when he had this experience? I, th I th and what was his childhood? I don't, I guess okay. I would be guessing yeah, he, so, was, I mean, he was young. Yeah. So look at how that's affected him even to this day, you know? but, but pause right there. So a skeptic, if a skeptic's made it this long through the podcast is going to say, well, you know, they're young. They, they see things, they, their imagination, right? That's not, that's not the case with this. And that's, that's the, when I talk about this stuff, I always have to err on the side of defending my credibility. A skeptic's going to say what? Just like when I go to court, a defense attorney is going to say what? And I always think about it from what the skeptic's going to say. So that helps keep me objective. So, but my point is I know, and people don't know me. They don't know the emotion that I have and what I'm thinking about when I talk about this individual and what they told me in the stories. Could it have been a, a nightmare or a night terror? Or could they have seen something once or twice? Yeah, probably. But all those instances, not a chance in hell. It's not possible. Not with the credibility they have, because this person is objective enough to say, yeah, you know, looking back on it, it probably wasn't the boogeyman under the bed who's going to grab my ankles when I come back from the bathroom in the middle of the night. It, it, this, is, this is something that is so impactful on them. You know, it's not like the psychology where something's been impactful, but yet it evolves in your brain over time too. There's too many instances that are consistent along with what his siblings and his parents and everybody else experienced. You know, you can't explain that away. So it wasn't even just this, him that was having these experiences. His family was actually having experiences in the home. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. People don't realize how impactful these things really are, you know, and, and I could understand why it is so, so frightening to people that, you know, they, they don't want to revisit that home or even talk about it sometimes because they're worried that if, you know, if you acknowledge it again, it'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that time and time again with different, you know, cases. I remember, you know, we, we keep bringing up the Dice Road investigation out in Merrill when we started to open those doors and talk to some of these officers and, and the people in the community some of them did not want to talk about it. And they flat out said, you know, look, we just want to leave that alone. We don't want it to start up again. And that's a powerful thing. I mean, start up again. Mm -hmm. They were worried that just talking about it would, would conjure it. Uh, well, and again, you know, that's, that's not, that's not my area of expertise, but I can tell you that for me to even come here into the studio and want to 
discuss this. It's not an easy thing for me. I mean, you know, usually I keep my, my convictions and my beliefs myself. I'm open-minded and I, I, I think a lot of these things to myself, but I get it. I, I don't, I don't want to necessarily slap a label on it because I'm not qualified. To, I don't know. I've, I've got too many questions. I can speak to what I've personally observed, what I've witnessed, what I've been privy to, um, you know, through people telling me things that I trust literally with my life and have trusted with my life that builds for me. So when people don't want to revisit it, just vicariously through him, I don't want to revisit it. I don't want to know about that stuff. I don't want to have to experience it. I don't want to hear the stories about it because it, 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 it does, it, it, it shakes you, you know? So I get it. I, I understand where they're coming from with that. So have you yourself ever had an experience with the paranormal? Is there anything that you've ever encountered or? I've had a select few of experiences through the course of my lifetime that try as hard as I may, I certainly wasn't able to to explain. If by paranormal you mean experiences that didn't fit the realm of a rational explanation, then absolutely. But we have to understand that explanation may not necessarily be what we think that it is either. Yeah, I mean, for that matter, existence, life itself is probably not what we think it is. You know, the way that, uh, I mean, it is kind of fascinating, again, not to wormhole into a whole different podcast, but sure. even just space, time, gravity, I was just everything. Gonna, I was just going to say that. I'm glad that you broke the ice on that one. So <laughs> my my dad, great guy. I remember one time we were up north camping, and it was just a beautiful starry night, and we were by the, by the lake, and he said, do you realize that space goes on for infinity? And that blew my mind, right? Like, holy cow. We, there's There's everything we ever want to know. The answers are out there. It's all explainable, but we don't have the answers, you know? Yeah. Trying to wrap your, your mind around infinity alone is, is pretty insane, especially at a younger age. Yeah. So, I mean, that blew my mind though. Right. And that stuck with me. I'm like, holy cow, it goes on for infinity. That's like forever. And then some, you know what I mean? So I'm trying to wrap my brain around and that always stuck with me. And, but then again, we know that all the questions out there can eventually be explained. There, there is a scientific or other explanation for things, be it, be it creationism or evolutionism or, or God or whatever you want to affix to it. Somehow, some way, there's an explanation for everything. We just don't necessarily have it. And that explanation may not be rationally rooted into our culture or our way of thinking. One thing that really uh, affected me when I was younger is I remember, uh, it's kind of a funny story. I was a kid and I snuck up to watch Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. Okay. So my brother and sister were watching. That show scared the hell out of me, by the way. Totally. They were, they were older than me. So what I did is I literally snuck out of my room and I crawled across the floor. Yeah. And the way our couches were, we had kind of that, you know, those rounded couches yep. that went in the corner. So I was able to sneak in behind it and then kind of peek between where there was an armrest and watch the movie. So of course, you know, I go to sleep, I start having nightmares about it, you know, and then I, I, I get stuck on this topic of death for a while mm-hmm. as a kid. And then this was that moment where... Uh, I was super young and I remember talking to my, my parents about it. My dad's like, well, cause you know, I'm fascinated, you know, why were these things coming out of the ground? Why were they in the ground in the first place? And so my dad was like, well, you know, when you die, you get buried mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, so, but that's only if you die. Right. And yeah. he's like, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in my mind, I'm kind of like, well, as long as you don't die, you're good. You know, as long right. as you don't have an accident or something doesn't happen to you, you don't get murdered, you're you're good to go. But then it's like, as the conversation progresses, it's like, well, no, everybody dies. Right. So I'm just like, okay, wait, wait a minute. What, what do you mean everyone dies? You know, so at that moment, I'm realizing mortality. Sure. You know, so I'm like, okay, well, am I going to die? And then there's that awkward moment where your parents are like, well, everyone dies. You You're going to be mean? really old. Wait, no, yeah, not for exactly. a long time. So yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. so I'm going to be dead and buried, you know? So at that point, right. you know, your brain's like starts to just warp, you know what I mean? Like that's like a life changing moment. You so know? To, he, he, we brought up an interesting story there. So I've, I've got two younger boys. Uh, my youngest is seven. And uh, a few years back, we had a couple deaths in the family, uh, my grandma being one of them. And we would go, we went to the funeral. She's a Catholic lady. You know, you had the whole Catholic mass, the funeral and the whole nine yards. And my it was my oldest at the time, actually. He he posed the question, so when's grandma going to go to heaven? And in, in, he, he put it in a perspective of, at the time, I guess he would have been seven or so, seven years old. Well, she's in heaven. Well, no, she's not. She's right here. When when When's, when's she going to go to heaven? And trying to explain that concept, it's like, where's Dr. Spock when you need him? You know, get on Amazon, order a book quick to figure this one out, how to explain that in terms they can understand. But you're exactly right. It's like, 
well, and then that goes back into she did go to heaven. This is the car. The driver just went into the store type type analogy. You right. know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and trying to watch them wrap their brain around it just poof, you know. It's like Yeah, those are huge know. moments, you know, mm-hmm. for, for, for humans, you know, when you're when you're hearing things like that. And again, I guess kind of going back to what we were saying uh, a little bit ago, that's probably why it's so difficult for some people to to accept things or, or take in knowledge or information that changes their belief system. Sure. Because their belief system is, you know, it's it's embedded within them. Uh, from what they're learning, from what they were oh, yeah. taught as, you know, as a child. Well, I mean, Steve, I think, think about how many wars have been fought over religion alone and religion is what your belief system, right? Right. So people are literally willing to fight wars and die for their belief system. Yeah. So anything that, that would threaten that just by, oh God, just, just thought alone, you know, mm-hmm. just, just believing that, okay, well, you know, a lot of credible people are experiencing that. There's a lot of, uh, of proof of, of the phenomenon on, on, on video. Mm-hmm. Maybe I should consider this. It's not going to come that easy with some people. That's for sure. It's not. And again, I, I, I have to remember that this, this, this podcast, for example, is geared towards those who, who do believe or are borderline skeptic and, and are interested in this. So really, I, I guess I don't need to focus a whole lot on, on the skeptics because they're probably not watching this anyway, and that's fine. But my mind always goes to, how do you explain this to a skeptic? You know, how do I establish that credibility with a skeptic? How do I explain that I've done my diligence in investigating this, that I've looked at it from every possible angle, that it's not a this, 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 or that, it can't be. And that because I don't know, I conferred with so-and-so who is an expert. I mean, I always, I always find my brain shifting to how do I explain it to the non-believer? I had this friend some years ago who was the absolute most ridiculously staunch. It's black or white, heaven or hell, no ghosts, nothing outside space. There's not possibly any other planet in the entire infinity that could possibly ever even resemble earth. This is it. You know, and, and it would drive me nuts. It's like, holy crap, man. Seriously, science has proven you wrong about a thousand times over. You can't explain it to these people, right? And, and I and I get it. I get where that comes from because in many ways, I'm still that guy and I have to force myself to be open-minded and say, all right, mm, that's kind of hard to grasp onto that one. But, okay, let's, let's back it with evidence. Where's the evidence? And it's really not that hard to find the evidence that supports either side of the claim. So if you've got enough supporting evidence that says you're wrong, but you've got enough evidence, equal amount that says you're right, kind of tells you that a rational person should probably meet in the middle on that and be, hmm, well, maybe it's either way. That's a big aha moment when you can say, well, maybe it's somewhere in the middle then. And I, I think that to get somebody there is, is a, it's a pretty hard task. There's probably, you know, two questions at the end of the day that, that really compels man uh, our minds and and that's are we alone mm-hmm. in the universe and what happens after death i mean if you really think about that that kind of encompasses everything you know sure. are we alone in this in this universe and what happens after we die how do you get those answers you know my, my belief system is that you get all those answers when you die but it's the right. it's the waiting game that's that's the the agony of it right you know, and that even just kind of, you know, dabbling a little bit with uh, like ufology or, or you know, in, in space, mm-hmm. it's also amazing how much evidence is now coming forward in that department. I don't know if you've recently seen, but the government's been releasing videos. They actually had, a, you know, for lack of a better word, a task force that they assembled mm-hmm. to study this for like 10 years and actually came forward. The government themselves have, have leaked footage, you know, uh, legitimately leaked footage where these aircraft carriers and these yep. fighter pilots are, are catching these insanely uh, gravity defying things, mm-hmm. you know, that are that are turning and twisting and stopping on a dime right. and then shooting off at speeds and, and in ways that we could not possibly comprehend. So to that point, let me let me just give you a little bit of background here. So my dad, again, super cool guy. He's an, he's an old school hippie, both the nicest guy, most mellow guy you'll ever meet. When I was growing up, he was really into to all the the metaphysical stuff and, and epigenetics, and uh, he you know he read so many different varying religious texts to to compare them and, and try to get a baseline. Um, paranormal stuff, uh, psychics, and it's not that he was necessarily I don't want to say a, a believer or non believer, but he wanted to arm himself with with as much knowledge as he could. So as a kid, 
I was surrounded by a lot of this stuff. And admittedly, I was like, oh God, <laughs> my, my, please don't talk to my friends. You're, you're nuts. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. but that gave me a foundation that as I've gotten older, I'm able to, to, to draw my own conclusions and, and I develop my own thought processes on these things. It's been nice to not be completely foreign to the subject. Um, kind of like algebra. You know, you took it in high school, then once in a while there'll be something that comes up on Jeopardy. Like, oh, I remember that. You know, it, it has some relevancy in some places, so it's not completely foreign to me. Admittedly, I've got my 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 thoughts may differ from his, but to your point, it does say something. I want to call that old buddy of mine who's like, yeah, there's no way there's anything extraterrestrial out there. Well, when when you literally have governments all over the entire world actually releasing footage saying, well, we don't know what this is. And this is becoming way more mainstream where they're actually acknowledging that, hey, look, th this by all definition is unidentified. We don't know what this is. And our government, the people that we're supposed to trust, our elected leaders are saying, yeah, there's something. We don't know what it is. That should be a flag unto itself. Now, that's a whole other you know, podcast. That's, that's a whole other topic for a different day. But when, when society is able to say, yeah, okay, so these, these things that people have been reporting that everybody called them crackpots for and stuff like that, now our government's going to come out and say, and they have, and this is not, this is not speculation, this is not crazy talk. They're, they're coming out on Fox News, CNN, NBC, all the networks, and the Navy's saying, yeah, we're putting together a task force because we're seeing these things. Here it is, fighter pilot footage. We don't know what it is. That should, that moment, whether whatever conclusion you want to draw, that moment alone should be enough to say, huh, what's this all about? That, that should be the pivotal moment for people to say, hmm, but what if, let's just play the what if, uh, I don't know, wouldn't it be fair to say that that would absolutely unequivocally shake people to the core and everything that we know about society, humanity, science, and everything else in the entire world be immediately, instantaneously changed? What well, shocked me a little bit, in fact, uh, you know, I remember seeing, uh, I think it was on Fox, there's a guy, Tucker Carlson, that mm -hmm. that he's a host of a show on there. And I was I caught it at a hotel. It just happened to be on in the background where he actually covered this, which is interesting because, you know, he's a very political mm -hmm. driven guy. He doesn't, uh, you know, report on things like this. But he was blown away that, you know, that this footage was officially uh, leaked, so to speak, or, or put out for people to see. He couldn't believe that the media wasn't making a bigger deal out of it. Right. You know, and I, and I think what that tells me, uh, two different things. One, it tells me that people aren't surprised. Right. Well, that's very true. That's people a really aren't good surprised. Yes. You know, I think, you know, I think a lot of people are under the belief that we are not alone in this universe. I don't really know how you could believe otherwise. Sure. When it's, when it goes on infinitely. I mean, think about 50 years ago, how many planets we thought existed. Yeah. Nine, and now, nine. yeah. And <laughs> how many planets are we learning exist today? Literally it's, it's infinite amounts right. of planets. So, you know, I think that kind of attests to something as well that, you know, people weren't surprised or, you know, I think everybody was kind of like, mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We knew that a long time ago. Right. But I think number two, it's, you know, the, the forces that be sometimes uh, they don't they don't want to change those belief systems. So they're not really going to make a big deal out of it. And and there's all, you know, and, 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 and it's industry as well. You know, I hate to bring that into it, but but there's money. At the end of the day, some people, you know, they, they don't want things to change because, you know, and, and maybe I'll use this in the podcast. Maybe I won't. But, you know, even with religion, there is money in religion, you know, and I think that there are also times where the church doesn't want to recognize certain things, because if it does change a belief system of their of their followers, what does that do? I, I think that's a very, very plausible example. And I don't disagree with that. I think that this a whole acknowledgement of things that we had to always turn a blind eye to or or call people crazies or, or put them in insane asylums, you know, 60, 70 years ago for saying, hey, I saw this or, I, you know, I saw this in the sky or whatever else that we're, we're now at a, that goes back to my earlier point, right? Things continually evolve and change generationally. We're at a point now where what would have gotten somebody laughed at and, and kicked out of every local establishment in, in, in town is now being released by our own government saying, hey, this this thing people have been seeing for for you know, the longest time ever yeah we, we we got it on footage we don't know what it is that that is huge maybe it is man-made maybe it's not i i'm not an expert they don't know I, I sure as hell don't know but it should be the pivotal moment where people say huh all the people that once claimed that they saw x y or z just got a little bit of credibility inherently based on the evidence that was ultimately ultimately released right 
Right. So that that should, if their credibility goes up, shouldn't the credibility go up for the other people that are saying the same thing that are being laughed at right now? In some cases, I think that that should make their credibility go up because these are instances where we used to scoff and ridicule, but now things have changed and we're recognizing that it's not so funny anymore and that it's not even a big deal anymore and that all the networks are covering it and it's becoming commonplace dinner table topic. So where do you draw that line in the sand? Because somebody ha- claims they had a paranormal experience, we're gonna laugh at that, but we're not gonna laugh at this. And that goes back to the, the what I said in the opening about you, you believe in that you go somewhere when you die, 80% of the world's population, but you're only firmly gonna staunchly believe that you go here. There can't be anywhere else in between. That, that logic just does not sit well with me. And that's what I struggle with. So let's talk a little bit about our area here, you know, Saginaw County, Bay City. What is it that you feel is the cause of so much activity? Um, I mean, why, why are so many experiences happening here? Why do so many people believe that they're dealing with hauntings in their home? Let's focus on that last part. Why do, why do so many people believe that? Because I, again, I, I gotta, I gotta be honest. It, I can't say that they are or aren't happening, but why do so many people claim that it's happening? That's a really tough question for me to answer. And I've wondered that before because it certainly seems like this area alone has such a, a broad spectrum of individuals from all different demographics that have either experienced or claim to have experienced or know somebody credible who has. And I've wondered that a lot as well. Um, you know, you try to rule out the obvious. I guess I don't have a real reason. I guess if you were to try to attach a lot, an explanation to a paranormal explanation of the history, I, I suppose you could go that route. Um, there's too many unknowns for me to really say that, but there, I will give you credibility and, and validate your statement that there really is a lot of people, very credible people who publicly and privately or one or the other have had or claimed to have had a lot of experiences and, and profound experiences too. That That's the thing. Yeah. That's, that's what really um, is interesting to me. You know, like I've obviously traveled the country a lot, you know, whether it be touring with music or, or with um, you know, the series investigating. And a lot of people ask me, they, they always say, well, how can you have so many films in one area with haunted Saginaw, like how, how could there be so many different hauntings right. in that area? And what blows me away is my response to them is we can only handle one case a year that we document for these films. Right. And yet we're getting 50, sometimes 250 uh, very credible cases being brought our way. And that's a huge number. You know, I mean, the city of Saginaw only has what a, about a forty thousand population. Obviously, you know, the county a lot more, and the sure. township, and yeah. but still, I mean, we're we're relatively a small area when you really think about it. So for us to get flooded with that many requests to come out and you know and check activity, I mean, even while we were sitting here today, when we were getting ready to start, I have another email about four paragraphs long yeah. about an old house in Bay City, about fifteen you know fifteen minutes away. But that's an astounding number per capita. I, you know, one of the, one of the things as I think about this, as you talk about it, I would have to say that in this area, it's more, I don't want to use the word accepted, but it's certainly more discussed. And maybe if that discussion alone is behind closed doors with, with close friends, those close friends talk about it next close friends, it's kind of the game of telephone. And I, I wonder if sometimes that doesn't have to do with the fact that people have come to accept it more or at least be more open-mindedly skeptical to it in the area. And that's kind of perpetuated the willingness for people to say, Hey, me too. You know, I've got a claim about this or what do you think about this? And that, let's be objective, right? Are, are they all paranormal? Probably not. But what if, what if at least one of those is, and we know from the films and the credible witnesses here that we got a lot more than that when you're trying to decipher why that is, you know, it could also be because there is so many things taking place here. That's why so many people are willing to talk about it and why it is so accepted in this area, you know, because we travel quite extensively, you know, in a lot of towns when something does happen, it's a big deal and people get upset. They don't want people talking about it's it. It's taboo. It's very taboo. And around here and certain other cities, I mean, not just Saginaw alone, of course, but there are some communities like Atchison, Kansas is very similar to Saginaw in the sense that 
you know, there's so many people experiencing something. And sometimes you just wonder, is it a geographical thing? I know that in our field, there's a, there's quite a belief that, that water uh, is some type of a conduit okay. for activity. And we're surrounded by the Great Lakes here, yeah. uh, you know, and, and a lot of rivers, a lot of water, a lot of wetlands here. Sometimes it makes you wonder, is it a geographical thing? Uh, is it just, you know, is it the history of the land, which, you know, you brought up, which a lot of times we know that the history of a town or a property or home, obviously, most of the time is the key to what's happening and as far as paranormal is concerned. Yeah, you know, and, and I can only talk what I know about the local history. So believe it or not, as cool as I am, I'm kind of a dork too. I like local history a lot. And this town has got, this and Bay City has got some really, really awesome history that goes way back to the Native Americans. And settlers coming in and the development of industry and logging and things like that. They're, this This area is really steeped in some pretty amazing history. So I don't know if that plays a factor. I, I wouldn't know. I'm not the expert in that, but certainly if it does, there's plenty of it there. You know, one thing that's interesting about Saginaw's history, you know, Bay City, the Tri-City area around here, and a lot of a lot of places in Michigan, but particularly here, the lumber era was huge. Mm -hmm. And I mean huge. You yeah. know, more money was brought in uh, during the lumber era within a seven-year time span than was made in the gold rush in California. Really? I yeah. Didn't know so that. when you think about that, I mean, that's astounding, you know, and, yeah. and needless to say, a lot of money was here. A lot of industry was here. And what we've learned from historians in the, in the area talking with them, one thing that's kind of fascinating is they all say that the Wild West didn't have anything on the crime and the ruthlessness of during the lumber era. That's which, true. Yeah, which I thought was amazing. I mean, you would see, I remember when we were filming a hunting on Hamilton Street too, and we were at the stable, the, the place where we met, mm -hmm. uh, They that used to be a funeral home. Yep. And they had some of the old ledgers and some of the old texts and books in there where it would say some crazy stuff. You know, it would say, you know, picked up a Swede at fourth and fifth, you know, mm -hmm. head bashed in. Uh, yeah. or, or they would call it rolling where they would literally walk up to people they would rob them. They would hit them with a blunt object, take their money and throw them right off the bridge into the river. Yep. So you know? like in downtown Bay City, and, and again, I, I think local history is really cool. Not even from a paranormal standpoint, just because if you want to know where you're going, you should probably know where you've been type thing. Correct. And like uh, St. Laurent Brothers, downtown Bay City, that used to be an old saloon and a, a whole bunch of stuff back in the lumbering area where there was actually a trap door on the floor where if somebody was caught cheating in cards that they would literally pull the handle like in the cartoons and right out the right out the trap to the Saginaw River and that's that's not lore like that's documented like you can see where everything still was and that's really cool stuff so it was a it was a rough and tumble era back then in this in this geographical region alone you know it's really creepy when you're talking about the trap door I remember when I was in uh about five or six years ago I was in Portland Oregon and a friend of mine uh, knows a guy named Mike Jones uh, that that operated the, what they call the Shanghai Tunnels. I don't know if you're familiar with this. Nope. Uh, it's been on a lot of different document, you know, documentaries, TV shows, things of that nature. But basically, in Portland, Oregon, they would literally hijack people and 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 put them into slave labor on ships. Really? So yeah, people at random, you know, people that were alone or maybe a little intoxicated that were easy victims, they would basically kind of push them into an area, hit the trap door, they would fall down into a cell full of broken glass, all kinds of crazy stuff. Jeez. They would go down there, they would remove their shoes so they would be afraid to to try to get anywhere or climb up on anything. And then basically they would kind of take all these people and then kind of herd them and then sell them to the people at the ports and put them on the ships. So basically now it's you're on the ship, you're going to work this or we'll just throw you off into the ocean and you're dead. Good God. Yeah, it's called the Shanghai Tunnel. So I actually went down into those tunnels and saw a lot of these things that still exist. And I think they still give tours to this day. But so it's pretty chill. Bay City actually has, um, in downtown Bay City, when it used to be East Bay City and West Bay City, they've got a bunch of old tunnels where you could actually get from shop to shop and stuff like that. And that, that I would love to go down there just for historic purposes and just scope it out. Yeah, we have those in Saginaw, too. Tunnels. Oh, really? Yeah, they, yeah, definitely in the old town area. What's interesting is Hamilton Street is actually, basically, the, the, the current Hamilton Street is basically above the original Hamilton Street. Oh, I didn't know that. Which is really interesting. And if you get down into those tunnels, you'll actually see some of those buildings. You'll see uh, part of the building that used to be above ground. Oh, no kidding. But is not today. That'd be so cool. Yeah. yeah. Like, from the Shook Hotel down to the river and a lot of that Prohibition stuff, you know, where they're yeah. smuggling in the booze and stuff during that that era so if if indeed if there's some correlation between paranormal activity and the history of the land that we stand on then it would certainly lend credibility if that's the case just based on the 
the incredible history that this area has. One thing that's interesting too about Saginaw is like, like a lot of, of towns in the heartland or the, or the Midwest community is a lot of triumph and a lot of tragedy. It's been a boom town, you know, huge with the lumber era. Then all the lumber is gone. Everybody, you know, it's all gone now. What do you do? Uh, then the economy drops, industry drops. Yeah population drops and then of course you know down the road it picks up again automotive GM, yep absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. so another huge boom that goes on for a while then of course then that drops you know and it's interesting how you know a lot of the major cities on the coast obviously los angeles and in new york you know and then even throughout the midwest there's select cities like chicago that always have their their stronghold there's enough industry there enough population to where it's going to continue to maintain but then a lot of these cities in the heartland the midwest not so much right. you know there's pulses tight and sometimes you you just kind of wonder does some of that residue or energy kind of stay within it it's almost like the gray zone is what i call it in between the coasts you know yeah, and, and you know, I think what you're doing right now, going coast to coast or going through the heartland is really cool because I think it gives you as a producer and as an investigator a, a, a bigger picture to continue your investigative work in an objective way. And again, I, I got I to gotta throw you a bone here that the, uh, the people who watch your films, you know, you've got your fan base, but they don't, they don't understand the amount of editing just the evidence alone to make sure that it's legitimate. You know, so when when you've got something that you know is good, you, you have so many T's that you cross and so many I's that you dot to make sure that it's legitimate evidence. I think by you being able to to scope out other places across the country is going to give you a, a I don't want to say a better idea of what you're dealing with here because I think you already have that, but I certainly think that it's going to make the quality of the investigations just just take it up the next level with all the cases that i've investigated and all the people i've met and all the families i've worked with and dealt with i think that you know people don't really understand the effect that the paranormal has on the human psyche you know what what people go through with the haunting you know and that being said i mean think about it from this perspective right if there's counseling out there for, for lots of things in life, right? You know, if sure. you, there's divorce counseling. If people, you know, have a bad breakup, they, mm -hmm. sometimes they go seek counseling. Yeah. Um, if they, if they're depressed or they're sad or our loved one passes away, they've got grief counseling. Absolutely. There's counseling for people out there trying to get off of cigarettes or, mm -hmm. or, or some type of substance. What do you think it's like when you're living in a home where you truly believe that there's forces that are unseen that are attacking you? Well, if I go back to um, my friend that I referenced earlier, I know that it was extremely impactful on him. And I think where the issue comes into play is this. There are too often, too many times where we are quick to affix a label to somebody. Oh, they're, they're making things up. They're, they're liars. They're fake. This, is, this isn't real. And not to say that the activity is X, Y, or Z, but their experiences are real and the way that it's impacted them is real. And I think that we as a society need to be better about being empathetic at a minimum of something that they're going through. Just because we can't open a textbook and say, oh, you have this symptom associated with this, take this pill, doesn't mean that they should necessarily be discredited either. Because again, going back to what I said earlier, there's going to be perpetual evolution through our generations that make us say, oh, remember, remember 100 years ago when we used to laugh at the people for X, Y, or Z? Things are going to continually shift and change. And, and I guess the natural progression, hopefully so will people being able to get counseling for things like that. I know talking to my buddy, his experience has traumatized the hell out of him. And it would have, it would have me too. If, if what he's saying, I believe him, happened, um, <laughs> he'd be put me in a padded room somewhere. I'd done, bye. <laughs> that would have been it. Yeah, you know, I can completely understand that. I mean, I think that's something that should get focused on more, you know, and that's something I'll probably do at some point in my career is, is you know, of course, I, I always want to continue to investigate and the goal is to try to figure out why and how and, and capture things on film because, you know, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. It goes into the database of, of wondering what these things are and everything that you find or capture, anything that's truly anomalous or paranormal, it helps to kind of put a little bit more uh, piece of the puzzle together, you know, for the research. But I think that the human element of a haunting is is fascinating and it's it's tragic, it's fascinating, it's a lot of things, you know, and I think that that's something that needs to be explored a little bit more uh, because, you know, the effects of these hauntings are great. You know, they really are. They're great meaning just powerful, mm -hmm. uh, super 
vastly powerful, the effects it has on, on a family, the way it changes the dynamic of people, how it affects them as they go out, you know, even just through life. Uh, for example, like your friend, you know, and so I think that, you know, hopefully, if anything, as, as this time and research goes by, uh, not only are people going to be able to try anyway to figure out what's happening, why, what are the cause of the activity, but hopefully the people that are experiencing the stuff that, that are truly being traumatized by it can actually seek some help, you know, because how do you go receive counseling or help from somebody when something doesn't exist? Well, how can they help them? Right. So, you know, and that's, that, that's ultimately the tough question. Like I said, where I stand, you know, I've got my own religious beliefs. I can't tell you that there's, there's ghosts or there's not ghosts. I can't tell you one way or another. I can tell you there's certainly been things that I've experienced with your team that there's not a rational explanation for. There's things that certainly are the holy crap moments that how do you explain that? So even for me, who, who is relatively rooted in, in reality, to experience these things plays an effect on you that, that really does make you question a lot of different things. So if you're having to live through this perpetually or you've got these profound experiences, these great experiences, certainly it can be something that, let's just say it, you're going to want to get some help about because it's going to mess you up. And understandably so, but where do you, where does that start? I mean, how are you going to, how are you in good conscience going to walk into a doctor's office and say, hey, my house is haunted, it's messing me up. You think that's going to take the direction you want it to take? Most likely not. So whether the house is haunted or it's not, or you think that it is, or you, whatever the case may be, anytime anybody's feeling something that they need professional help on, it should be taken seriously. And that goes back to where we're at in history of not being open-minded to the unexplained. Really trying to help these families and, and people have kind of become the new focus. Because, you know, from my standpoint, I don't need to prove anything to skeptics anymore. Right. You know, that, that, that passion is over for me. I know what I believe. I know what millions of people believe and experience and have caught on film, but it's about trying to help these people, you know, with that process. If, if I may turn the tables and ask you a question here yeah. in your experiences with, with going across the country and, and your, your vast experiences in investigating the paranormal, when you, I know that you've talked to plenty of cops and, and professionals who are in the know, how often do you find that when they're off the record, they're willing to to sit here like I am or more and say, no, this is what happened. But on the record, oh, I'm going to tell you only this. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember specifically this district attorney uh, was, you know, talking to us and, and he definitely solidified, okay, look, you know, there, there was some very uh, ominous, malevolent things attached to this case. This, this is, was a real thing. Uh, but that's all I'm going to tell you. And then as soon as that camera went off and he was very adamant to see that the cameras were off and that the audio was turned off. And then he told us some extraordinarily uh, just devastating things, you know, that surrounded this really horrific case that uh, that happened about, uh, I think, about 20 years ago. Yeah. Around, yeah. And, and it was just mind blowing. I mean, here's this guy that is, you know, obviously, you know, very educated, um, very refined to, to do what he did and retire from from having a status like that, mm -hmm. you know, and the epitome of objected and, and evidence based and is telling you things that, uh, you know, you would only think you would hear in, in folklore, right. So to speak, you know, and then, and other people around him backing that up and actually being afraid to talk about it. There was a point where they just didn't want to talk about it anymore. And, and almost, you know, afraid that talking about it once again, uh, conjure something or could bring right. it, bring it back. So, yeah. And I guess that was my question too, cause don't get me wrong. When, when we're, we're standing around the, uh, the box of donuts, drinking our coffee, which we love to do. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot more openly than we would in front of regular Joe civilian, you know, and, and, and I walk that line, not because I'm on camera right now, but because genuinely I don't have the answers, but I am willing to be open-minded that there are things that we can't explain and we don't have the answers to yet. And that we can't file that under it's this, if we don't know conclusively that it's this, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. So that goes back to my question of how many times have you run into, and you just answered it, how many times do you run into police officers or, or firefighters or uh, district attorneys who are say, no, you know, I, I walk this line, it could have been in this or that, but as soon as those cameras are off, oh, let me tell you the real story. Let me ask you this too. I mean, have you ever been on a call yourself or even know anyone who has where an individual has called the police because they think there's something paranormal taking place in their house. Yes. So there, there have, but I got I got to preface it with this. 
you have people sometimes who call who it's not it's not paranormal or they have an underlying condition that makes them believe it's x y or z so let's let's root that all that stuff out right let's root the for lack of better words the the crazies as, as some people may call them out we're going to put them over here in this category there are the other instances where people call and say there's somebody in my house i just heard somebody running up the stairs and then i heard someone slam a door we go in we treat it like it's a break and entering our home invasion in progress we can't find anything you know we we only have so much time at people's houses we can't stay there and launch an investigation house is clear of bad guys on to the next call ma'am house is secure have a good night call us back if you need anything that doesn't mean it doesn't go through your mind when we get out to the car and it's just the two cops walking back saying good wouldn't, wouldn't find myself staying the night there you know but to that as well could it have been something like a windows open and a gust of breeze sure it could have but there's other times that we've been out there for various things it's like yeah it just made my skin crawl and the hair on the back of your neck stand up because you know in your gut that it doesn't make sense and doesn't add up. Right. We just don't have the time, resources, or availability, or manpower to stand there and, and pull out the technology and the tools and the things that you guys have and really delve into this. We're looking at it from a criminal. Someone breaking into your house, someone stealing your stuff, someone hurting you. No. Okay. Your house is secure. Lock the doors. Call 911 if you have any other problems. Have a good night. If a person goes as far as to call the police. Mm-hmm. That's got to be pretty impactful. I mean, they must really believe that somebody is in their house to actually pick up that phone and make that call. In a lot of instances, yeah. So if someone's calling the police and, and they're over here in the, the rational pile, let's call them, okay? There's something obviously that's scaring them to make them need professional intervention who can handle the situation, mitigate the situation. That's where we come into play. So anytime we deal with anybody, if you if you've been a cop long enough, Cops are quirky. They sit a certain way. They drive a certain way. They sit in restaurants a certain way. There's certain mannerisms and things that we do. And one of those things that we can't turn off and you can never turn off once you've been a cop long enough is reading people. We, we know that we get the most of our communication through body language and all, you know, all that good stuff, right? I won't get into that whole bailiwick. But when we're talking with people, inherently, if you're talking in their own home, they're more comfortable. You you pick up very easily once you you pick up a baseline of the way they talk when there's deception in most cases not all of them so you get a pretty good grasp in most instances any whether it be your car got broken into or somebody shot up your home or I heard something in my house you get a pretty good baseline of what the person is telling you and how to move forward with that you can usually separate the wheat from the chaff pretty quickly if you've been on the job long enough it's just something that we, we pick up. It's a skill. So when people are passionate, say, no, I'm telling you, my windows aren't open. I heard these noises on my stairs and I heard run down the hallway and slam the door. I know what I heard. You, you, you baseline it, you treat it like you would any other interview and you try to assess it the best that you can. And that's, those are the ones when you walk away, like, I don't know what that was. You're uh, you're setting a, a a really cool example, I think, for people to understand that you know law enforcement doesn't always scoff at this type of thing, and I think it's really interesting to see somebody in your field and in the way that you've had interactions with with the paranormal to some degree. Sure, or at uh, least your views on it. Well, I, I genuinely appreciate you guys tolerating my perspective. I, I know that you know off camera, you often ask me questions, and I'll, I'll say I, I don't I don't know, I can't answer that, you know, and and a lot of things I can't answer, and a lot of things I'm not willing to put a stamp on. And I really appreciate you guys bearing with me as I as I, I I would probably tend to believe that I'm relatively difficult sometimes but I, I, I genuinely appreciate you letting me hitch my wagon to Haunted Saginaw as long as you don't pull any more guns on me or or, or sick dogs on me for investigating yeah you just stop breaking into those old uh old Hamilton old Street buildings yeah right yeah, yeah exactly it'll be cool man yeah it's funny you know like that that moment will definitely be etched in my brain forever because yeah. it's not very often that you meet somebody that you know, it was basically like, what are you doing? And it's like investigating the paranormal. Oh, did you catch anything tonight? Yeah, it was, it was a weird transition, right? <laughs> yeah, just like that. Yeah, I think you broke the ice, though, when you just, in, just here's a cop with a dog and a gun. And you're like, hey, man, what's up? You know, <laughs> you want to come in? Yeah, I'm like, um, so this guy's pretty cool, I guess. Maybe going to prison. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other. Yeah, right. And the rest is history. Yeah, it's right, man.